Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Second Shift January webinar. We are so excited today because Sandy Sloan is back and she's brought two friends with her. And this is really exciting because Sandy is a Second Shift member who formed an alliance with two other women who are close friends that she met in a women's networking group. And they are all now Second Shift members. And they realize that across ages and career skill sets and um, generations and uh, and they were able and now actually even locations because they're remote and in all different places they were able to see the power of joining together and creating something that they call business abnormal and today they're going to teach us about how keeping connect connections and keeping your network strong is really good for business. And last time Sandy did this webinar on her own, I found it fascinating and spent the entire time scrawling and taking notes, copious notes to make sure that we could have this up on the blog. We'll be doing the same thing this time. I will make sure that everything, uh, the highlights are put on the blog. This video will be put onto YouTube for anyone who misses it or has to duck out a little bit early. And if you have questions, put your questions in the Q&A. And then at the end, I'm going to make sure that your questions are addressed. So I'm gonna let you three ladies take it from here. Sandy Sloan, Lori Cecil Bonanno, and Miranda Wilcox. Thank you so much for being here. This is so exciting. And, um, you know, just love building the second shift community. And I love to see it in action when the ecosystem works. It's a beautiful thing. So thank you so much for offering your time and your expertise. Thank you, thank you Jenny. And thanks for, um, thanks for having us here. And thank you everyone for joining us today as we discuss connection and community. So we are a group of women sitting around discussing connection. Um, I'm a coach, I'm leading this conversation. This sounds like it could be a real touchy feely, warm and fuzzy type of thing. And while it is warm, um, we're really here to talk about stuff that's um, strategic and really critical to business. In the words of the great Brene Brown, Connection is why we are here. Oh, one second, Miranda. I don't see your shared screen. So I just oh, want to make sure that, that we do that right. I see your picture, but not the shared screen. Thank you. Rather deal with that right off the bat. Love it. Thank you. All okay. right. Now we're here. That? Perfect. We can see you can make it larger if you want. Otherwise, I see your little, your picture next to it too. But that's up to you. I think it, it's not the full screen. Kiki, got any help? I'm taking a look here. That? I see. It, can you go to the next slide and then and then hit backspace so that we're on this one again? Um, Is it not the full screen? Yeah, I, I see that. Um, hmm. It's almost. Um, <laughs> it's I... almost the full screen. Optimize screen share. I'm just opening my own. Now, this is the beauty. We're how many months in? And is that better? I hit the no. Hmm. I would. I would go ahead and um, and continue um, with your uh, wonderful kickoff to this presentation, and I will jump in to see. Let's see if that's. Wait, I'm playing around on my own else. screen here. There you okay. go. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so Brene Brown, who is um, famous for discussing um, imperfection and um, the gifts of imperfection, um, she'd be proud that we're embracing imperfection with our technology. Um, so Brene says that connection is why we're here. And she doesn't mean here on this video call, she means here on the planet. We are hardwired to connect with others. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. And without it, there is suffering. According to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, connection is right in the middle of stuff that humans need. 
Uh, this is a motivational theory in psychology and it categorizes all human needs into five levels, physiological, safety, belonging and love, esteem and self-actualization. According to this model, um, as our needs are satisfied, our attention and our wants ascend the hierarchy to the next level. So we're motivated by any of these levels only after we satisfy the ones below it. So for example, if an employee is scared for her safety at work, launching an employee of the month program isn't likely to motivate her until she feels free of danger and that she belongs to the work community. So really we, we satisfy these needs um, in order. And we can't effectively meet needs of people or groups if we don't appeal to where they are on this hierarchy. So if we think way back to another world ago um, in February, pre-corona, um, most of us on this call were undoubtedly focused on these top two levels, um, esteem and self-actualization. And as a coach, that's where I was spending most of my time with clients. But then the world changed, right? By March, the end of March of last year, 72% of Americans claimed that their lives had already been disrupted by coronavirus. And by September of last year, 66% of households already reported having financial problems. When COVID hit, suddenly our base needs, the ones we were used to having satisfied without really thinking that much about them became threatened. So suddenly we were worrying about our safety, about our kids, our loved ones. Some of us couldn't sleep. Some of us struggled to pay our rent or grocery bills. And so this caused a reshuffling of our needs. And basically what happened is that we shifted down in the hierarchy. So our collective aspirations shifted away from wanting to be our best selves toward wanting to be safe and protect the people that we care about and also where to get hand sanitizer and toilet paper. So nearly a year into the pandemic, um, now we can see light at the end of the tunnel, but the relative importance of belonging and love remains really strong and we all need community like we have more than we have before. So according to Merriam Webster, community is defined as a feeling of fellowship as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. The second shift is a, com is a community. And one of the silver linings, and there are some silver linings of the horror that's been happening um, in our world over the past almost year, um, one of the silver linings is that this crisis has created a shared experience. So despite the to wear or not to wear division of, of masks, we're currently pretty united. Um, most of us share an attitude of wanting to move on from this virus. We share an interest in recovering personally, economically, and socially. And we share the goals of ditching masks and starting to see friends and family, to go out, to travel, and to get back to our lives. And that shared experience is a type of opportunity, an opportunity to connect. Now you may feel like you're already overly connected. And if you are an introvert like me, um, can, more connection might feel like the last thing that you want. Um, technologically, we are more connected than ever. We're constantly online and in network. And if we live with other people, we're spending a lot more time with them. But psychologically, we're pretty disconnected. We're burned out from excessive screen time and ineffective virtual meetings. We're st we still have some overwhelm um, caused by the current normal that we're in. Some of us are drawn to doom scrolling and um, we're tethered to our devices. And even when we are in person, we're socially distanced and masked. And this reality is accentu accentuating a pre-existing problem that we have as a society. 
And that problem is loneliness. An economist named Norina Hertz claims that even before a global pandemic introduced us to terms like social distancing, loneliness was well on its way to becoming the defining condition of the 21st century. Many countries invest significant time and resources in studying and alleviating loneliness. And many believe that we're not just facing a viral pandemic right now, but also a loneliness pandemic. And that's not just sad, it's also costly. Statistically speaking, loneliness is as damaging to our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. 15 cigarettes a day. Economically, it costs us as much as $960 billion annually and loneliness contributes to increased physical illness like heart disease, strokes, dementia, mental illness like depression and anxiety. And it also fuels divisiveness because the more detached we are from each other, the less we understand each other. So a lot of people think that we, that means we should unplug or plug in less and research tells us that less screen time can be a good thing, but we don't think that unplugging is the answer to disconnection. First of all, it's not viable. And second of all, it has so many benefits. Being connected to technology um, increases our safety. It can be a, a lifeline to some people for their mental and their physical health. Um, it's what enables us to do social, social distancing in a lot of cases. Um, technology gives us, gives us, gives work. It bridges geographies and it gives us logistical flexibility for things like childcare, which as we know is especially important for women. What we at Business Abnormal say is that we need to do better at plugging in. So not stop plugging in, but do better with it. And the way to do that is to use technology intentionally, leverage relationships, build community, and communicate to connect. So when we spend a lot of time wired to technology, we can find ourselves in a type of psychological cocoon that insulates us from connection. In-person and electronic interactions feel really different because they send different levels of stimulation to our social brain. And there's a ton of neuroscience research behind this, um, none of which I'm going to share and most of which I don't understand because it's above my um, expertise, but what I can tell you is that the full activation of this part of the brain happens during face-to-face -face interaction, but not screen-to-screen -screen interaction. So we need to compensate for that loss by working harder to connect in meaningful ways. So to use technology more intentionally, be mindful of your online behavior. Turn off autopilot and engage, whether you're on screen or in life. Don't kill time with social media or email. Have a purpose and decide how much time to allot before you even start on your screens. Now, leveraging relationships is what brought Sandy, Lori, and I here today. As friends and business owners, we reached out to support each other early in uh, the COVID days. Um, we had a lot of what the hell is happening conversations, um, provided each other support, and we considered how each of us could be impacted, both as people and as business owners. And throughout our conversations, we saw some opportunities where we thought we could collectively address some challenges that were coming out as part of um, what was happening around us. Um, some of the challenges we were facing and some of the challenges we anticipated our clients would face. 
And that is how Business Abnormal was born. We are a communication collective offering a robust suite of services. And now when each of us is marketing our own respective businesses, we're also looking for opportunities um, for each other to get business on our own, um, as well as opportunities for Business Abnormal. We got here by leveraging our existing relationships. And that happened by, my dogs are barking, <laughs> that happened by helping ourselves as people and um, embracing connection. So who have you connected with more deeply? Uh, what opportunities could you be missing? To leverage relationships, resist isolation, use technology to minimize distance, distance not add to it, be creative and find new ways to connect. Now I'd like to introduce you to Thea. Named for the goddess of light who endowed gold, silver, and gems with their brilliance, Thea is a virtual membership community for professional women. <clears throat> Its purpose is to connect, support, and empower amazing women at a price they can afford and with the flexibility they need. Members in this community engage in group and private discussions, attend professional development workshops, get on-demand coaching, and gather at social events. Tomorrow, there will be an inauguration party in honor of our first female vice president. I launched Thea in response to the longstanding challenges of women at work that were compounded by the additional stress of COVID, particularly for small business owners and for solopreneurs. And although it's in its infancy, the community is seeing high engagement and members are already partnering on projects and receiving help from new connections. And it's really affirmed my belief in the importance of community. And if you wanna find out more about Thea, there's an address there above. Now here's another community that I just learned about a few days ago. The Buffalo Bills were scheduled to play their divisional playoff game on Sunday. And because of the virus, fandom um, or the expression of fandom has been uh, restricted. So the stadium attendance um, was limited to only 6,700 instead of like 60,000. Um, bars in New York State now close at 10 p.m., which was less than two hours after kickoff. And house parties in New York are limited to only 10 people. So a Buffalo drive-in movie theater saw an opportunity. They invited 650 cars to a free live stream viewing of the game on their four big screens. Then um, as fans filled those spots, cheered and honked during the game, they posted their experience on social media. So rather than staying home, all these people sat in their cars in January in Buffalo so they could be with their fellow fans. That is the power of community. What you can do to build community is consider who you wanna hang out with. What do you want to offer or get from other people? Who could you bring together? Now, as I mentioned, Business Abnormal is a communication collective. Um, Sandy, Lori, and I all have decades of experience in communication. Um, I'm going to make this super simple and give you a very high level. This is what communication is. It is two parties who exchange messages with each other. That is basically it. So each of us is a source and as we send a message and a receiver as we receive that message. Now communication um, doesn't always go as it is, uh, as it's, as is hoped. Um, but when it goes well, when it's done right, we form connections with other people. And the more we communicate effectively, the deeper those connections can be. And the more we can, we can create that sense of love and belonging that people crave. 
So this is how to communicate to connect. First, slow down and see. One of the gifts of quarantine and social distancing is that people are doing less. Our lives have become, in some regards, less busy. Slow down so you can sense what's happening around you. Resist doing and embrace being in the present. Focus outward so you can see others and meet them where they are. Balance compassion with action. This was the sentiment of an HBR, Harvard Business Review article um, last May that said, in, during difficult times, it's more important to monitor people's affect, mood, and stress rather than check on their work performance, productivity, or task management. So that's Harvard Business Review telling us to be compassionate. We have to get stuff done. That's what makes it work but we also need to make space for feeling. Know that you don't fully know what's happening in other people's lives. Listen, research has shown that hearing someone's voice helps us humanize them. So give the person speaking with you your undivided attention, whether they're across the table or on video or on the phone, just listen. Listen to understand, not to reply. Listen with an open mind, be curious, forget what you think you already know, and consider what you might learn. Define your purpose. Our purpose is our compass. So we need to get our heads clear in order to take the right direction. Consider the end, where you wanna go, as well as the means, how you want to get there and stay grounded. We get into trouble when our emotions take over. And when our internal resources, our energy reserves are low, it's easy to get emotionally hijacked. We need to stay in our rational mind in order to connect with other people. Try to avoid what ifs and shoulds. Those things typically don't serve us well. Instead, be mindful of the power of connection and use the tools that are available to you. Some of which Sandy and Lori are going to share with you now. Thanks, Sandy? Miranda. Miranda, I think I'm gonna be able to do this on my own, so let's see. Hold on, maybe not, hold on. Miranda, you got to go back to doing it. Okay. No worries. All right. Okay. Okay. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Back one, there we go. Okay, sorry everybody. Those of you who know me know that technology is not my strong <laughs> suit. So thank you, Miranda, for helping me on this. Okay, first we're gonna talk about the importance of connecting. Miranda has really shared quite a bit about it, but I love this quote by Eric Fischel, so I wanted to include it. Connecting to another is one of the most important things in the world and you can keep expanding that connection one person, a family, a community, a country, a society, or even a full culture. And it's the building blocks of connecting with one another that make us all really, really good with connections and with communicating. And we know that humans have always been really inherently social creatures. We travel together, we hunt together, we thrive in social groups. And there's really good reason for that because if you take traveling, for instance, traveling in with a group of friends, it provides safety, it provides knowledge about the places that you're going, and it provides that shared experience, which is really about connection and community. 
And those of you who watch CNN, and even if you don't, you're probably familiar with uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, he says, connection for protection. So I think that's really, really relevant to this because we are protecting ourselves when we are part of a communication and, and connection collaborative from feeling isolated, especially with what we're all going through today. And as Miranda pointed out in Maslow's hierarchy, connection and the feeling of belonging is truly one of the most important needs that we have. Miranda, click please. Commun ah, back one. Communication equals human connection. Paul Meyer was a pioneer in the personal development industry. And so we all know the statement to be true. Communication equals human connection. Communication, the human, wait, back. <laughs> the human connection is the key to personal and career success. And that is in a nutshell, very, very true. The more connected we are, the better we are in our personal and professional lives. Please click. Love this, every day may not be good, but there is something good in every day. We know that perception is reality. So if you're looking for something good, you're going to find it. And even though we're all feeling really negative right now, there are really positives to this pandemic, even though they were hard to find, but if you look for them, you will find them. And I'm gonna share what those are in the next slide, please. The positives of connecting during the pandemic. All of these different silhouettes are asking questions that many of us have had. How do I stay optimistic, connected, motivated? I'm so bored. Well, there are several positives about this. First and foremost, I really think, because I'm a big networker and a big connector, you no longer have to have a brilliant opening statement as a conversation starter with people you don't know because to put it very simply, we're all in the same storm, but in different boats. So we're experiencing much of the same adversity and many of the same feelings. We know how we feel when people ask us how we are, okay? The positive here is with this built-in icebreaker, you can check in with others to see how they or their businesses are doing. And before COVID, we all did this, how you doing? and everybody's answer was always fine or good. Now people might actually share what they're feeling. So how you doing is fine for an icebreaker now. If you wanna get even more creative, ask a question like, what's one thing this pandemic has made you grateful for? But in that case, be prepared with your own answer because somebody will say, after they are finished giving you their answer, they'll say, and what about you? What are you grateful for? Just be thoughtful, be kind, be genuine, and show them that you care. Don't always just be transactional because people are just really happy to get a gesture of goodwill. Another thing, despite what has happened with the technical difficulties on this call, everybody's now a Zoom expert. Before COVID, most of us had no experience at all with web conferencing, but the positive is that's all changed. And we know that virtual meetings and connecting online are here to stay. And we finally sort of almost know how to use these platforms. We're getting better every day. Another positive, organizations are adapting to the, these new realities. I would venture to guess that every person on this call has been to a trade show or a conference or both or other networking opportunities. But since most of the in-person events have stopped, Many organizations are moving to online networking. And what is positive about that? The world has gotten smaller. We can easily meet with other people from across the globe, from across, across the globe without flying cross country to participate in a conference or a trade show. And if you live in Denver, like I do, you'd never suggest meeting someone from San Francisco for coffee unless you had a private jet. And I don't think most of us have that. But now you can, you can meet for coffee with people online because the distance is irrelevant. So that's a positive. Another big positive is we now have more time, even though some of us feel like we don't, we actually do. So you have time to use your social media to reconnect with old acquaintances and send out regular messages to keep in touch with them. Whereas before you 
looked for that time and frequently didn't find it. You know, when we connect digitally, that's one of the best ways available when seeing people in person is not possible. And right now it's pretty much the only way we have. So share the occasional helpful article or a funny link and you'll be top of mind and you'll also let people know that you're thinking of them. And the positive again is we have time for this. We also have time to learn new skills. I, like most of you, probably went through most of the Netflix catalog, but I was getting pretty bored watching TV all the time. So I took some of that time and I taught myself to knit using a YouTube tutorial. And then I joined an online knitting group for novice knitters. We basically, we just show each other our mistakes that we've made, but we laugh about it and we feel connected. Also, I was getting really upset and, and discouraged be, and depressed, frankly, because the gym was not open, still not open, and my trainer was not able to train me because of COVID. So I looked online and I found daily live exercise classes on a platform, if any of you are interested, it's really great, called Fabulous 50s, and I feel connected to that community of others who are also working out. I just found out that for less than the cost of one takeout pizza a month, you can take a dance class taught by prima ballerina Misty Copeland or even a tennis class taught by Serena Williams. Those purpose-driven activities activate our brains in protective ways. And again, back to Sanjay Gupta, connection for protection. So if there's an online class you've been thinking about or people that you want to connect with, you actually have time. You just have to make time to have the time and get away from that Netflix and the popcorn that you're making. Okay, next slide, Miranda. Nurture it before you need it. This is so important. If you treat your connections as a kind of personal ATM you use for frequent withdrawals, you'll quickly be disappointed and you'll be overdrawn. And this is a statement from Tony Alessandra, those of you who have taken some of my seminars and webinars before, he originated the concept of the platinum rule and I love him. He's just, just great and full of wisdom. So what this really means is when you're connecting with your current network, do it before you need to do it. Stay in touch on a regular basis so that they don't feel like you're only reaching out because you want something from them. Connection is really a give and take interaction. And funny enough, this morning, right before this webinar, I received a LinkedIn message from someone I haven't interacted with at all in any capacity in over three years. And she asked me for a favor. I, I, frankly, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And the timing was pretty fortuitous because of this webinar. But she didn't even say, how are you? Is there anything I could help you with? What are you up to these days? She just launched right into the request. And you know what I did? I deleted it. So that was really perfect for this because had she been in touch, I would have been happy to help her, but I wasn't. And I didn't. Next slide, please. Social connectivity, who is your current network? Coworkers, customers, social network, and your friends and family. We're not gonna talk about friends and family today. We're gonna to talk about the others, but the feeling of closeness and connectedness to a community rooted in feelings of belonging, love and common values. That's what social connectivity is. Everyone we interact with is part of our network and everyone has a lasting impact on our, both our physical and our mental health. So it's really important and imperative that during social distancing, we continue to find ways to connect with each other. And right now that means coming together virtually. Our social connections provide intellectual stimulation, emotional support, and that helps us get through hardships. And stress and isolation can be really, really challenging, especially today. So hang out with people, even virtually, who give you that sense of belonging or love or value. Like Lori and Miranda for me, whenever I'm having a down day or something either personally or professionally, they're two of the people that I go to. And they are buffers against all of the stress that I might be feeling and they make me feel less lonely. Next slide, please. Connecting in the time of Corona. Coworkers 
are an interesting group that we really need to remain connected with. According to a Gallup study, the number of people working remotely has grown by 44% over the last five years. In 2020, and as we call it BC, 2020 BC, before COVID, there were already 7 million people working remotely in the United States. That was 3.4% of the entire US population. And 88% of organizations worldwide made it mandatory or encouraged employees to work from home if they were able to during COVID and after it was initially declared a pandemic. Today, 42% of the labor force is working from home full time. Now, 19% of remote employees report loneliness as their biggest challenge. So those people, it's really important to help figure out how to connect with them even though before the pandemic, we all thought, oh, working from home, that would be so cool. We'd love to work remotely. And it really was one of the biggest factors, having flexible uh, work schedules and, and being able to work from home were really, really requested very, very often as a non-monetary way that employees felt valued and they were able to continue their work-life balance. That's not the case anymore. Studies have shown we are more productive on individual tasks when we work remotely, but the opposite is true with tasks that require collaborative efforts. So team members who feel more socially connected are more likely to improve productivity on collaborative tasks than those who feel disconnected. What do we do to ensure coworkers feel connected? and not be part of that frightening statistic about loneliness. Miranda. There are so many platforms today, Zoom, Google Meet, Google Meet, Hangouts, WebEx, Skype, there are so many and more and more are coming. And they're getting better and better. And they allow us to interact sort of face-to-face, -face, at least from time to time. And that helps us maintain a sense of connection and belonging. Seeing someone's face allows us to feel more connected to them. So video meetings are way more effective at decreasing that sense of isolation than audio only conference calls, which is what we all did before the pandemic. But the tricky part is just like with in person meetings, the more we meet, the less time we have to do the work. So it's important to make the most of the meetings and plan them carefully so they don't become a burden because just because they're easy doesn't mean we should use them too much. Miranda, connecting with coworkers, how to do this. And these are the how to, some of the how to tips. If you're the person in charge of setting up meetings, schedule regular status meetings one on one and with a team. Always have an agenda in advance. And this is good for even non COVID times and non remote, time, remote working times. Distribute an agenda listing the expectations and the action items so you're not wasting other people's times. But for the virtual connecting, use screen sharing and whiteboard functions to mimic in-person meetings. Just like we're sharing our screens now, this really helps you see what we're doing as opposed to sitting in a conference room, which we can't do. But try not to turn every meeting into a never-ending list of tasks because people just can't keep up with those. However, with the tools available today, we can make meetings feel like face, we're in face-to-face. -face. We can share files, we can share presentation decks, we can share our screens. There are whiteboard functions to just jot down brain, uh, brainstorming and mind sparking. So online collaborata collaboration is much easier. Miranda? I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with slideuplift.com. It's a great resource. And I love also giving people resources on finding information. They have really, really nice slides and, and you're allowed to take them. So this is an infographic about uh, virtual meetings, some of the how-tos. They say, be humane. Ask the participants about the well-being of their friends and family. Always try to start meetings with, how are you doing? What's going on? have some special time just to share social information before you launch into the meeting. Again, to feel that sense of connection that you would get before the meeting actually starts in the boardroom. Be respectful of their time, set the objectives, have agendas, use those video tools, and there are lots of them. 
provide the audio dial-in option because some people cannot use the laptop or away from their house or, or they're with a kid and they don't want to do that, that's okay. So provide those audio dial-in options, test the technology ahead of time. We did do that today, but still, I'm just not my thing. So, uh, but it's always a good idea to test it and make sure it's working and ensure everyone's point of view is heard. That's an important one. It's important because during our live meetings, there are people who are introverts who by their body language, who we might actually ask them, hey, what do you think? We don't see that as much on video calls. So do a sort of an around the horn, ask people what their, what their points of view are, okay? Social time and team building. Have social online gatherings to maintain the bonds and host a monthly event like Think, Link, and Drink. Think, Link, and Drink is my own creation. And what I've done with clients and also with friends in advance, I tell people to think about something that they're grateful for or curious about or something that they've read and they want to share. I ask them to come prepared to share a link to a website that's educational or entertaining so that everybody can get their benefit of the time that they have spent online and to share a recipe for a cocktail that they're enjoying during the call or at another time or a coffee drink or a smoothie and give a recipe. And this is built in ways for connecting and it, it allows people the time to be able to share this information in a concrete way, especially people who are a little uptight about not having some structured time. Everybody misses that water cooler feel that, that Miranda was talking about even with Thea. Everybody misses that water cooler feel in, in the office, having pizza together, having a cup of coffee. So make time for socializing and team building online. You can schedule lunch together once a week, twice a month, and be able to talk to people while seeing each other without the constraints of a formal meeting online are gonna help strengthen those bonds and continue the camaraderie that you have established in real life. But warning, don't meet too much because then people will feel really put upon for them and it'll strain their already challenged attention spans. But aside from uh, Thea, which I am a member of Miranda's group, and it is wonderful, and I encourage all of you to get involved in that, one of the things I had done for a client was a team building through voluptuary, and that was a uh, wine tasting. We had wanted to do a wine tasting, the pandemic came, so I found this company called Voluptuary that offers virtual wine tastings. They actually send you the wine to your house, five little samples of wine, and then they have a wine tasting video and we're, we're all watching it from seven different locations and we were tasting the wine and, and going along with the video. It was a lot of fun and it's very reasonably priced. Icebreaker.com is a place for you to find icebreakers and fun interactive games and activities. So is Jackbox, Netflix party, you can watch a movie with your friends. There's no shortage of this. Miranda, how to connect with your customers. This is another one of the social groups I was talking about. Right now, it's really hard to connect with our customers, especially when we were used to taking them out for a meal or a drink. So we have to figure out ways to do that. Check in regularly, but be a resource. Tell, don't sell. That is also a Sandyism. What that means is you have plenty of time to establish a selling relationship where they're going to spend money with you, but be a resource and a partner for them. Ask them how they're doing. Tell them about what you are doing. Don't sell them right now. There is plenty of time to do that later. And people buy people, they don't buy companies. And that is very, very true. So it's much easier to maintain contact with people when you are in contact with them on an ongoing basis. Share articles and information, things that have to do with your business are fine, but maybe they just told you that they were interested in going to Costa Rica and you see an article about that. Send it to them. They will appreciate you, and when it's time to spend their money, they will spend it with you. 
This is my favorite one. Well, the last two are my favorites. Male handwritten notes. I'm a big card and note writer and love that. If you have their mailing addresses, send them a handwritten note because how fun is it to get something in the mail that is not a bill or junk mail and it's a, it's a great surprise. The same with sending little trinkets. Easily and cheaply, you can make up a little basket, sort of I'm thinking of you with little trinkets the Dollar Tree, if those of you who have Dollar Trees in your, in your areas, it is the ultimate place to get those inexpensive trinkets to mail. They keep you top of mind. Let your customers know you're thinking about them during this time. And FYI, Valentine's Day is coming up. I have already started my little baskets for my customers to give them Valentine's goodie bags that they will be very happy to receive. It's just fun. And I think for the cost of five bucks, I'm a big hero. Next slide, how to connect with your social networks. Follow them and comment on their posts. And again, this is information that you should be doing all of the time, not just now, but follow them, comment on their posts, share the articles and information of interest to them, send messages to get reacquainted in advance of asking them anything like the woman did with me today. Make sure to reference something they've said or done and how you know them. Because if you're somebody like me and I have over 2000 connections on my LinkedIn, I, I really, I don't remember everybody. But speaking of LinkedIn, many of you who have taken my past seminars, remember I connected with you prior to my presentation and anybody who's new today noticed I connected you, with you before today. I got the list, I got your LinkedIn and I connected with you. And I said something personal to each of you about what you did or what our commonalities were. So probably made you feel pretty good and everybody accepted my connection requests. If I didn't connect with you on LinkedIn, it was because I couldn't find your profile or you had a, a name that was very popular or maybe hor horrible to think, but maybe you don't even have a LinkedIn profile. And, and that is really a problem, but that's another seminar. Uh, but now you're all part of my network. I'm part of your network and we can work with each other's connections, which is great. So you should reach out to your network. You should reconnect with old connections and see what new relationships you can form to expand your network. If you've been thinking about any of the groups or new commun communities, this is the time to do it. You can join a new community, jump in, and most people are happy to help you during this time. And keep using these platforms and connections because the spike in social media uses usage and participation in virtual concerts, family dinners on Zoom, FaceTime happy hours, don't keep them only during COVID-19, hold on to them because it has been a way for you to be connected with some of your social network and it is a way to keep going once things return to normal. And my last slide, next. Okay, this is just me and Solutions by Sloan. I do that in addition to Business Abnormal. So, these are some of the things that I do. And I am going to just say, for those of you who are not connected with me, but most of you are, reach out to me if I can help you at all. If you need help figuring out your team's passion and igniting it to a roaring success, just contact me. And now I will give it over to Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Just gonna... Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. But not in full screen. Yep. Ah, everybody's face was covering my, okay, you can see? Perfect. Perfect, okay. So Miranda talked about the one-on-one -on -one, and Sandy talked about your existing communities and I'll talk about expanding your communities, even from home. So according to McKinsey and Company, the US spends $8 billion on diversity training every year, $8 billion. What we're mostly up against but not limited to is unconscious bias. It's important to note that biases, unconscious or conscious, it may exist toward any social group, which includes the regulars, race, ethnicity, gender, religion, sexual orientation, 
and it extends to age, weight, socioeconomics, physical abilities, languages spoken at home, and special health care needs, and the list can go on and on. Unconscious bias is often incompatible with one's values, which creates a lot of unconscious barriers when expanding your communities. I'd like to share two examples. If I ask you to describe a kindergarten teacher, the first thought to come to mind may not be a man. And conversely, if I ask you to think about an engineer, you might not think woman and or not a person of color, and this is unconscious bias. So as we expand our communities, you wanna think about who you're looking to attract and be mindful about it. Identify and acknowledge who you may inadvertently be leaving out through your communications or the lack of. For this, I suggest going back to basics. Who are you looking to attract into your community? Who do you wanna speak with? What are you saying? Where are you reaching these people? When are you doing it? When is especially important in these turbulent times? Be mindful and read the room, uh, the virtual room. How can you ensure your communication reaches your intended audiences? Really be honest with yourself. Are your communications really expanding your community or are you creating a bigger bubble? We can dive a little deeper. So while in-person might be on hold for a little longer, there are no shortages of online opportunities to connect. Think about industry, interests, roles, geography, things that you enjoy that inspire you and what you do. So maybe you're a founder who loves finance, fishing, fitness, food, and you're looking to relocate to Florida. Be creative and mix and match those interests. Most importantly, think outside the box. Maybe you're looking to learn something. Brainstorm what you like, what you wanna learn, and where you wanna spend your time. Many of you joined today joined because you've seen Sandy in particular speak previously. Find relevant conferences, look at social media and mix meetup groups. Ask for introductions, join events like this. Be open to expanding your network and the list goes on. And just like that, you're building and expanding your communities. So we tend to attract people who are like us. Looking beyond your own identities is a great way to build community. So on a business, Note, take a look at you and your company's website and marketing materials. Do your stock photos accurately represent your current or prospective customers, community, and or network? If not, commit to diversifying your stock photography use. There are so many sites that make it easy to be purposeful about representation. There's Tonal, Nappy, which are uh, stereotype-free, culturally diverse stock photo sites. The Brewers Collective is a division of Anheuser-Busch, which offers a collection of images with people with disabilities. And while there's still more work to be done, if you look, you can find. So this slide is um, a quote from Karen Aquono, who is the founder of Tonal, which is one of the stock photography sites I mentioned. So in addition to what she says on this slide, she continues, that relatability factor of seeing people who look like you in various forms of media, give people permission to bring their whole selves to places like their work, school, or other settings. So related, prioritize pronunciation. In the previous slide, Karen's last name was tricky, but instead of mangling it, I did my homework to make sure I got it right. Even though she's not on this call, it's the right thing to do to make sure to get it right. The first time you connect with someone is usually an introduction, and the first thing you learn about someone is their name. This shouldn't be anything but a positive experience. Take a second to think about the last person you met who wasn't John Smith. Do you try and get their name right? Do you mangle it and move on, or do you avoid using their name completely? According to research cited in the Harvard Business Review, learning how to pronounce a colleague's name correctly is not just a common courtesy, but an important effort in creating an inclusive world, one that emphasizes psychological safety and belonging, which sounds very similar to the quote cited in the previous slide, because these are things that help with someone's sense of belonging. If you come across a name you're unsure of, ask the person to pronounce it, repeat it, practice it, and if someone else is pronouncing it wrong, correct them. On the flip side, if you have a name that gets mangled, be clear and correct the person. It's your name and someone that doesn't try shouldn't be allowed to make you feel small or bad. Think about it another way. If someone genuinely doesn't know and continues to mangle your name, how embarrassed might they be when they learn they've been saying it all wrong? LinkedIn recently added a feature allowing users to record the correct pronunciation of their name 
So you can actually hear the person saying their name and it's been really well received. So saying someone's names correctly makes them feel that they matter. I cannot tell you how many times my maiden name is converted from Sussel to Sussy. Too many times to count. If someone has ever pronounced your name as a burden, like it's too hard for them to deal with, you know what I'm talking about. The people who make a genuine attempt at my name insecurely are, not surprisingly, the ones who get it right because they took that extra second. And my name isn't even hard by comparison. So this article is a terrific read and you can find it. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to point out is that Samara Fazek was used to people pronouncing her name wrong, especially in school. She knew when there was a pause during roll call, her name would be next. And she says, quote, it never hurt me until high school graduation, she recalls. This was a big day for me. My grandparents from Bosnia came just to watch me get my diploma. And of course my name was butchered. And that's why it matters. Whether it's graduation or first impression, pronunciation matters. So the key learnings is that by using images where people can see themselves and by pronouncing people's correctly, names correctly, we can give positive perceptions of self-worth, provide psychological safety and belonging, which are two easy tips to implement, especially when working to expand our communities and especially when working remote. So we're all familiar uh, with To Kill a Mockingbird. So mindful communication discourages homogenous messaging. Being able to communicate with all of our senses is something many of us take for granted. And as Harper Lee writes, as Addis Kiss Finch, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. We should seek to eliminate as many barriers as possible in order to communicate with wider audience than our bubbles. Just like there are ramps in place in addition to stairs, inclusive design is that ramp for those who have visual, auditory, cognitive, physical, or speech difficulties. This graphic is from the UK government's website and I created a more memorable link for you to access it easily. For instance, use captions or provide transcripts of video content. The written word is helpful for those who may have hearing loss, but it helps people who can get distracted, can process written information better or are non-native speakers. Or maybe someone just prefers to consume your content without the volume. Using alt text in addition to images, if you see a description of an image paired with an image, this is called alt text. When a user listens to the content of the web page, the alt text is part of the content so they can still hear what is pictured. And also, one of the things I found interesting in my research is providing multiple contact options. Using the telephone as a required field is not a best practice. The phone is not always the easiest way. And as I mentioned earlier, as you look to expand your community, Continue to think about who you may inadvertently be excluding. Whether it's a new connection, a potential client, someone applying to work at your own company, the list goes on and on. So adopting accessible design best practices. This is just a quick example. So people who are differently abled and if somebody is colorblind, you can't see the true colors on the Nike site. So the true colors are on the left. What somebody who is colorblind would see is on the right. And there's no indication of the color aside from the color dots, which is really unhelpful. Whereas this Amazon image of the same shoe actually has mouse over text. So the user can read the name of the color instead of relying on the actual color. So you can't see it in a slide, but you can see right below the size where you can see color written which is much more helpful. And then when you're working to expand your network or community and it's not the community you're typically surrounded by, you need to be more thoughtful, mindful, and human in your communication. Like everything in life, it will become easier the more you put into practice. Did I make any errors in the presentation? Maybe. Am I always trying to improve? Absolutely. And am I human? I sure hope so. So Beth Dunn, the UX operations lead at HubSpot, wrote a medium piece in 2018 on the topic of instilling a human voice in product content. And she wrote, try not to present the privileged, tech savvy, wealthy, able-bodied, white, cisgendered, Anglo-centric male experience as standard and everything else as other or diverse. Seek ways to place the other in the center of things instead. She continues, 
What's great is that the English language is such a flexible, expressive language, so there are all sorts of ways to say what you need without indicating anything that might be exclusive. It just takes a little imagination, empathy, and practice, that's all. So to start, here's a few phrases that are not super inclusive. The catch all, hey guys, to a group of women, calling someone a girl if she's over 18, and a person is not their disability. For example, a woman who is blind instead of a blind person. So as we mentioned before, Miranda, Sandy, and I met through a local networking organization. And before March of 2020, we were friends, good friends. Come March of 2020, we really relied on each other for mental health, business questions, and friendships. And our relationship evolved into a business once we realized that our strengths complemented one another. Together, we have a combined 70 years experience in a multitude of areas. And we do represent three generations, Baby Boomer, Gen X, and Xenio. And that provides us with multiple perspectives. We're all part of multiple communities, family, business, social, college, high school, parents of young kids, parents of adult kids, empty nesters, and then by interest, theater, music, sports, the list goes on. These are all communities that we should be tapping into. So here are some tips, the recap to mindfully expand your community and building those communities and expanding into new ones takes time and effort. The rewards are well worth it. And then I wanted to thank you for spending time with us today. In addition to ELSIS, which is my communications consultancy and Business of Normal, I also offer a one-to-one -one advisory. I built this advisory to help my clients connect better with their potential and existing communities. You can visit my website for more information. And then I just wanna say thank you so much for being part of our community, even if just for an hour or so. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to spend with us. If you have any additional questions, um, feel free to reach out to us individually or as business subnormal and more than happy to open it up to questions. Wow. Um, thank you so much. That was so great. I mean, you ladies really have covered every base and I learned so much, whether it was the quotes or some of the, just some of the references and things that you, um, that you recommended from, I loved it. Um, I, I never knew about the stock photo and just really got my brain moving in so many interesting and um, insightful ways. So I'm gonna let the next like 10 minutes be questions. So if anyone has questions or I saw someone raised a hand, um, if there's questions, let's take the, the, go back to the regular screen view. So take off the, um, the presentation so we can all just see each other. And if anyone has any Q and A's, put it in the, um, into the, to the chat and then we, I can ask them for on your behalf and we can go from there. The, um, the, the part about being so thoughtful and mindful in the way that you talk to people and connect with people and design things really struck me. There's so many ways in which you have to think holistically around that. Um, and those, was it nappy and tonal and the accessible design thing? Uh, those are great references. Thank you for, for giving us all of that. You know, you don't have to give us all of your tips and tricks. So it's nice that you did. <laughs> that, was, that was terrific. So anybody have any questions? I mean, I can come up with lots of questions, um, but I just didn't know if anyone had anything that they wanted to say. Okay, one thing that I would like to know, I'm not the best at responding through, I, I find sometimes it's overwhelming. Usually I am, but especially in like this moment, everything seems so overwhelming and there isn't really a deadline so much. So it's very hard to feel like the pressure to respond to somebody if they're just like reaching out to say hi. I don't know, it just, time is so fluid. And I'm sure other people have that too. It's like all of a sudden days and weeks go by and you meant to respond, but you know, all the other things come up. Are there ways, Sandy, I feel like this is, you know, particular to things that you talk about. Are there ways in which you time box or think about like communicating it at certain times of the day? I don't know, how, how do I get myself to focus on the things that aren't like immediately necessary? 
Well, that is so funny that you should bring that up, Jenny, because I found a transformative, life-changing app. Uh, well, it's, it's really not an app. It's a way of doing things. It is called the stackmethod.com. And it has changed it has changed my life. Miranda, I told her about it. She's been using it. And it's a way of ordering your email so that I no longer have 2000 unread emails in my inbox. You know how many unread emails I have? And it's only since I've been on this call, six. And that's it. And every time I get a, a notification from LinkedIn that somebody has sent me a message, it's in there and it goes into my connect folder. It's a free application. It's it's so easy to use. It took me a little while to set up. Miranda, you too, right? It took you a little while to set it up, a couple hours, but it's by a guy in New York City and I ended up connecting with him on LinkedIn and we had a two hour phone <laughs> And he was great, but he does productivity tools, but for individuals, this, so this, it, it forces me, there's a do, there's a connect, there's a reply, and I put it in a specific order and I take care of it. And it, I've been using it for two weeks now. It's, it literally has changed my life. Thank you. Because I feel like overwhelmed and I know that, and I feel silly about it because there's so much time. But at the same <laughs> time, I don't know. Like there's it's just like, it's all just a big mush. And there's, and it's so hard to figure out how to make the set priorities. I'm going to check that out. I walked away with notes on so many things. I'm going to type all of this up and make sure that we put it out. We have one question and then I'm going to wrap it up because I think people are, uh, have to go on and do their things. But um, when building community, what are your thoughts on building or joining a paid versus free community? Do you think a paid offering increases participation? Miranda, you have a paid community. How, what are your thoughts on this? Um, yes, I think anytime people have some financial skin in the game, it increases um, participation. Um, it shows that they're committed to being involved versus just joining something on a whim. Um, there's also the, in a private community, one that's paid, you, um, you can keep out stuff that other people don't want to see like ads. So it gives you the opportunity to create a more custom and safe environment. Um, so if those things aren't important, then maybe a free community will work. Um, I think you just need to be realistic that a lot of the people who join will not get involved. And what about this question? Is it terrible to limit personal conversations at the start of a meeting? I found in quarantine, I just want to get to it and I don't want to chat. I agree with this. The, the 10 minutes it takes, no one's doing anything. So the catching up, it's just people talking about the same thing in circles. Everyone's got the same information. Yeah. So how do you, how would you limit that? Thank you, Lauren, for that question. Um, is it okay to just set rules like you do on, let's say Zoom, everyone knows the rules, we're, we're muting each other, we're doing this, we're doing that, like it's it sort of like become standard. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you structure what you're doing, I think it's really important to do something social at the beginning so that it's sort of a, a, a reacquainted situation. It doesn't have to be lengthy. You can say, I'm, we're gonna go around the horn and everybody is going to give one sentence about what you did this weekend, one sentence and, and cut them off. But it just, it continues the social connection because we really, you don't realize how much you do when you're in the office, just in the hallway. Hey, how was your weekend? Hey, did, did I tried this restaurant? It, it's just, it just continues the connect, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, is it terrible not to do it? No, it's not. But if you have the agenda, if you build it into the agenda, number one, everybody's going to share one thing or how you doing? What was the best thing of your, you know, what was the best thing that you did this weekend? You know, something sort of optimistic and positive could even just be like a quick answer. Limiting, right. limiting is, is a good thing. Um, skipping, maybe not so much. Um, but yes, if it's a meeting, definitely limit it because you have other things that you need to accomplish. Um, but don't skip it. 
Um, okay, we got another question. Uh, I struggle to keep up with staying in touch with my network. How would you suggest asking for help when you haven't spoken with someone in a while, especially someone who's trying to relaunch her career? Again, it, it, if you haven't been in touch for a while, at least take the 30 seconds before launching into what can you do for me? And here's what I need. Say, how are you doing? I saw that you did X, Y, Z. Whether you, whether it's sincere or not, it makes people feel good. If people were looking at any of the three of us, they would see things that we have written and they could reference that, hey, you were top of mind because I saw, I read about one of your children's books and you know on, on Amazon, whatever it is, makes me feel better and then continues that connection. Right, I think, we, I think we've um, come to the end We've gotten all the questions in and this was fantastic. Thank you so much, Sandy, Lori, and Miranda. This was a business abnormal. I am so pleased and proud that you are part of the Second Shift community. I think you are all fantastic with such actionable, interesting advice and thought leadership in this space. I'm very proud of our Second Shift community right now. So thank you. And I'm going to put this all up online, make sure that it's accessible with your websites and all the information so people can reach out and find you. Thank you for taking your time for to host this webinar today. And thank you to everyone from the Second Shift community who is here. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Thanks.